Hey guys, I'm Brent. I'm Lila, and you can find us on the web at www.braintrustlive.com. Yeah. If you or anybody that you know knows an angry liberal this week, <laughs> then we are going to be here to explain what exactly is going on with your aunt who bit your head off about something you don't care about and they don't care about that <laughs> you can't figure out what prompted it and you're not really sure what's going on. Right. Uh, they're mad at Joe Biden. They're mad at Joe Biden <laughs> is what's happening. And... It might not even be a progressive. It might just be someone who vaguely identifies as a feminist. It might right. be somebody who just hates the sight of hypocrisy and doesn't know how to direct their rage about general hypocrisy. Yeah. Um, well, that's been such a weird thing. We were just talking about this. <laughs> you <laughs> referenced an ant. Uh, right. It's so weird because like, I feel like people are mad. I've, I've been mad about this and I've been raging about this and I feel like I have been taking it out on people certainly. And I feel like we're just in this world where it's like everybody is mad about something. If they're not mad yeah. about Joe Biden, they're mad at Donald Trump, uh, you can be mad at both those things at the same time, but you might be mad that you haven't been able to go to the park. You might be mad that you haven't gotten a haircut. Like everybody has some sort of like rage that is manifesting in a way right now. Um, yours is yeah. Joe Biden, mine is Joe Biden, your mother's might right. be Joe Biden. My and mother's is definitely <laughs> Joe Biden. <laughs> and there are and they there are a lot of people um, whose answer to that question is Joe Biden. Yes. Right. Uh, and, and by the way, those people, are, my father's is also Joe Biden. So yeah, those people that, are not just the women in your life. It might just be anyone right. who does not like having a candidate who kind of gets shoved down your throat before you're allowed to vote, or maybe even after you're allowed to vote, but for, before your mom was allowed to vote, and then turns out to be unable to handle the storm that is a well-known accusation of assault that uh, we could have dealt with months ago, but didn't because the media shut her down. Yeah. Um, so this Tara Reid story uh, is sort of creeping into the mainstream. We talked yes. about it last week. We said that this was going to be a slow burn, and it has been a slow burn. This has been bumping around on the liberal Twitter. Right. For, or, or the far right Twitter. Or the far right Twitter, too. <laughs> Where, wherever it's been, you, it's been you bouncing look. around on, on non-moderate Twitter for right. a while. We, and, and not only was it bouncing around for a while, but what was bouncing around specifically was that she had approached multiple credible news networks only to be rebuffed as long as, you know, as, as, as long ago as like a year ago. Right. So it's not surprising that those same networks are just now getting around to reporting on it to begin with because they didn't want it to start with. Exactly. <clears throat> but I think what's happened here is that the New York Times had their own credibility called into question over this story. And so they have suddenly taken to reporting all of the media fallout of the story because they were accused initially of burying it. So, right. um, and they had to do a story about their reporting on the story at one point. So they've really gotten themselves <laughs> twisted into a bit of a pretzel about all of it. Um, right. So we're but getting we, to the point where Reed is still not getting invited on mainstream news networks. You know, no. CNN and MSNBC even are not inviting her. Fox is, but Fox will invite anyone onto anything. Um, <laughs> and then, but we're starting to see them having to talk about it on those networks, which they did not yes. want to have to do. Right. I saw, that's where we are uh, I saw Aaron Burnett do a story on it. Right. Um, and then Chris Hayes was really sort of the one who did the most in-depth reporting on it. Um, and that all that led to was hashtag fire Chris Hayes trending on Twitter for yeah. a little bit. So nobody had the right takeaway from Chris Hayes story there. No, <laughs> it wasn't, Chris, it, was, it wasn't, the hashtag that trended after that wasn't drop out Biden. No. Which is what it should have been. Right. It that, was that how dare you report hashtag. on the story. Like Chris Hayes also right. is somebody who fire I think the reporter? Any, no, I mean, anyone who is on the middle to left can respect Chris Hayes, I think. I respect Chris Hayes immensely. I think he does really good oh, yeah. reporting on a he lot does. of stuff. And I think yeah. that a lot of people in the middle can also agree with me on that. See that he's like a, at least like a general smart person who's like a, trying and, to and, tell and you also, what's actually happening. Sometimes reports on stuff that I don't want. I mean, sometimes he says things I don't agree with, but I always, I know that everything that he reports on is something that comes from a place of research for the most part. Mm -hmm. He's somebody who I consider one of the more intellectual hosts in the cable news universe. Yeah. And also one of the more respectable hosts, one of the more, you know, intelligent yeah. hosts. Um, and so I, I feel like this is hilarious anyway, because it's not like, like, sure, does fire Chris Wallace come up now and again? Yeah, yeah, it should. It's up to shenanigans yeah. over there. Does fire insert the name of anyone who's on Fox and Friends? Feel like it circulates from right. time to work. All well, of these and, people and lie to you on she, national television every day. But. Right. And when she was supposed to go on Fox News, the reason that she canceled was because she claimed she was getting death threats. Yeah. No, exactly. <clears throat> um, so I, I think we, we are seeing some interesting forces galvanize on the center left 
that are things that I think people associate with the extremist right or sometimes the extremist left, but not with themselves. Um, and these are people right. that are willing to go to the mat for moderation and not accomplishing much, basically. These are people who are incredibly challenged by the notion that we might not get to uphold the status quo. Yeah. Which I think is so hilarious. But Biden finally had to go on Morning Joe. He went, MSNBC finally had to interview him about it. Yeah. And I'm going to let Brent describe the interview because I was too angry to watch it. <laughs> Brent was well, like, are you watching this? And I was like, can you just tell me what happens because I can't. And he was like, I think it's probably better you didn't watch it. <laughs> Uh, well, they, you know, he went on Morning Joe and they let um, uh, Mika interview him first by herself. And I feel like she mostly did a good job and that she really did press him about sort of like how he could sort of square what he has said before about believing women with this. Yeah. And he just, he kept saying it didn't happen. It didn't happen. I mean, he categorically denied it for sure, um, but it, it didn't really, it weird, it was weird. The whole thing like yeah. felt very weird. Um, I, I don't really know how to describe it other than that, like, I don't think that he came across really well, but like, I think that the thing that his supporters were looking for was for him to just go on and deny it. Like, I don't yeah. know that anybody was really looking for much else from him. So on some level, I feel like, the people who were just sort of like concerned that he hadn't said anything publicly, but were already supporting him or were planning to support him anyway, probably were fine with the way the interview went. But right. it felt weird to me. And the thing that felt really weird to me, more almost than like any of the things that like came out of his mouth, was that they did that interview and then went to commercial break. And then they came back and the rest of the panel, including the men, came to join and then they just like talked about coronavirus as if the previous 20 minutes hadn't happened yeah which was very off-putting to me and i like well also this is a network that hasn't interviewed reed well, so right. it's like it's it's sort of more it's like what the new york times got criticized for in the first place which was they published a story they were they took a note from biden's team and edited the story without noting it to address a note from biden's team yeah um and so, and, and so it sort of felt like they were in cahoots with Biden. Yeah. And a, a setup like this, where you don't interview the person making <clears throat> the accusations, but you just interview Joe Biden himself, it also feels that way. Yeah. It feels like their intention is to make her seem not credible by not talking to her. Yeah. Um, and that they sort of give him the leash to deny it without getting the other side of the story. Yeah. One thing that she really pressed him on was this idea because what he has said so she has said that she filed a report at the time right. and so biden has said that that report would be with the national archives um because that's where such like reports like that would go like if you filed something like with right. the senate at the time so he has called on the national archives to identify any record of the complaint she alleged she filed and make available to the press any such document but he has all of his Senate documents at the University of Delaware. And we talked a little bit about this on the podcast last week. Right. Um, and so he was pressed in that interview as to why he wouldn't also do a search through those documents. And he had a lot of insane excuses for why he would not do that, um, including that he just didn't want people to be going through those things because they would be used for campaign fodder, <laughs> which seemed like maybe the worst excuse of all the excuses. <laughs> like, I don't want people to read those because then they'll know what I was up to for the last 40 years. <laughs> right. Then these records that are unbiased because they are just records of things that happen will be available to people to see. Yeah. Um, but that, I think, has caused him, that has caused, I think that he felt like offering to do the search through the National Archives would sort of allow everyone to be like, oh, okay, he's taking this thing seriously. But what it has actually done is really backfired in that way because now we've got both the Washington Post and the New York Times have called on him to release relevant papers that might be in his Senate papers at the University of Delaware. Yeah. And I think that by not releasing those, being okay with releasing anything that the National Archives finds, but not even sending anybody to look through those things, I think really smells. Um, well, and also, and I that think I think is, it also, it. It allows people to sort of create their own narrative about what's in those 
Um, you know, it's similar. It reminds me a lot of like when Hillary Clinton Clinton wouldn't release her Wall Street uh, speeches. You know, like there was a lot of talk in 2016 during the primary about what she said during these speeches that she got paid a bunch of money to when she was talking to Goldman Sachs, and she wouldn't do it. So it was easy to imagine what was in those. Right. You know, that's what I feel like we're in now. I think, and and especially since Biden said I didn't want people going through them because I didn't want it to be campaign fodder. I think it's easy for people's brains to you know, make up what's at the University of Delaware. Also, it kind of increases the distrust in our, sort of institutional distrust on the part of women, because if he, if, if, if filing a report can just lead to it never being available when you need it, then what yeah. is the point of the institution that allows you to file the report? And then also, if there is a report or documentation of a report that's in his Senate records but is not with the National Archive, then that inconsistency would create another sort of layer of institutional mistrust where it's like, well, these things don't get properly reported on the record right. anyway. And that's something that I would have no trouble believing is a possibility in this situation. So I just feel like why not be as transparent as possible about it? Because if if the problem was that we don't take these accusations seriously, as it was obviously the case at the time, then we all have reason to believe that it wasn't reported appropriately either. Right. And like all of this <clears throat> not giving us access to every layer of the process just like further compounds the sense that like not that maybe maybe she made the whole thing up, but also maybe that they all conspired as they could as the people that have been in charge this whole time against this random young female aide to not report it correctly. And that's also a, an outcome that without any information you can easily believe. Totally. Like, I, that's, it just seems like it doesn't give him any- Right, like, it, oh, a woman reported something like this and then proper documentation wasn't filed? Surprise. Like, who who right. would that shock? I mean, like, it's also shock very Trumpian. Anyone. It's very Trumpian to sort of be like, and this is a problem that I sort of felt was part of the issue that Clinton had distinguishing herself from Donald Trump early on. Um, it, it feels very Trumpian as we would now think of it, but it's something that both parties are consistent and can have consistently done in sort of not agreeing to be transparent about these troubling moments in their past and not agreeing to then learn from them. Like, right. you know, the idea, the, the idea of just flat out denying something that a woman says happened and then refusing to release any evidence one way or another is yeah. exactly what Donald Trump would do in this situation. And that yeah. is something that I think inherently we all understand about this. And inherently that's why what you're saying, the idea of only releasing one layer of transparency is problematic. That's inherently why. Like, yes. th that's the, the sort of the, the, the context that this is all happening in. Right. So it's sort of- It's it, just it such a weird- like I think implicit in the same kind of cover up. I think it is. And I think it was just like, a, I think it was a miscalculation on his part too. And I feel like he's had a lot of those in this too. And uh, you know, we're going to talk about a few, a lot. A, a lot. And it's weird because like, wow, I don't necessarily think that he is sort of like any sort of, you know, it's, it's political things like this where he like actually sometimes like seems to know what to do. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't think he's sort of is like the, the most skilled of the politicians like out there, but just in, no, in but terms of sort of like- No, but his has been rescued again and again by his ability to sort of smooth something, smooth stuff like this over. So it's weird to me that he did not see or his aides didn't see that by doing this, I, I almost feel like, and I wouldn't have told him to do this. I would tell him to be the most transparent, but I feel like being 0% transparent would almost have been better than being 50% transparent. Yeah. Like it may have been politically at least smarter for him to say like, it didn't happen. I'm not looking through any damn documents. Yeah. Because now we're sort of like, it's just gonna leave everybody to just sort of like stew about what's at the University of Delaware. Well, and then we're on a wild goose chase. Like we, it's the worst that's, of both that's worlds. Never because ended. we're on a, right. a wild goose chase through the National Archives, which has tons of stuff. <laughs> and then we're on a secondary wild goose chase where we just, you know, speculate wildly about what's in the documents. Yeah. And he doesn't win on either of those counts because either we find stuff in the National Archives that's not flattering, and that's all we discuss for the rest of our lives, yeah. or, and or, we don't find anything from the University of Delaware because we're not allowed to look through it, and we speculate on that for the rest of our lives. But either right. way, we're just going to speculate for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Um, it hasn't put anything to bed. And also, I did not, like, I, this is why I think a flat-out denial in this kind of situation doesn't put anything to bed. 
because it doesn't address the context in which this behavior could have been perceived as wrong, even if that was not exactly what happened. And I think in this post Me Too moment, the thing that people need to do to have their, you know, to, to sort of clear themselves after these charges is not just say this didn't happen categorically, but say we swim in a sea of misogyny. We live in a, you know, so of course I have, in participating in society, I have participated in <clears throat> appropriate things and I know that. And yep. so I know that the context is such that even if I didn't see myself doing anything wrong, that Tara Reid might have been put in a situation that made her uncomfortable because that's the sea we're swimming in. And right. I want to see when you have a denial from someone like Joe Biden about something like this, where he's been accused of participating, violating women's space, of participating in similar but not as extreme acts, all left and right, up and down, you know, right. for the You've last seen 30 it on years. Your television. I've seen it with my own eyeballs. I, I want to hear him say, I know that I, I know that this would have been wrong and maybe I didn't do this, but I know the water we're swimming in is dirty water. Like I know that we, I know that we all have to do better and that I am part of society, basically. Right. Well, and I, I, think that I, I am, it's like there was, a, there was a, um, a line on The Office at one point that was where Michael Scott says something like, you know, it's society that makes us do X, Y, and Z. I don't even consider myself part of society. And like, that's what I feel like the answer, like this is what Joe Biden has just said basically is like, you know, I, I don't want it, the kind of answer that these politicians give to be, you know, well, I'm just not a part of society. Like society right. is, is messed up and I'm not a part of society. Like right. I want the answer to be like, I am in society. So I respect that I have, even if unknowingly participated in acts that made people like Tara Reid uncomfortable and have otherwise, you know, changed the trajectory of their lives without doing anything to me. And like, if that's the water we're swimming in, then I probably have done inappropriate things and I know that and I'm of course gonna do better. But even if this accusation isn't true, let's all learn from this moment. Yes, I agree. And I also, and, and I think the, the Democratic Party needs to also say something of the sort yes. too, because that is what is, has really been bothering me about so much of what happened this week is that we really sort of like saw people having to, tr you know, twist themselves into knots. And like so many people have been like saying like, I've had, a million different people who knew I've been mad at this tell me something to the effect of, well, her story has changed so many times. Yeah. Which like, yes, it probably has. It was 25 years ago. And that's what happens with survivors of sexual assault. That's a thing. And also that's, that's thing we that know, we know that traumatic memories are inconsistent right. a lot of the time. And we also know that you have to have a trauma for you to have a traumatic memory. Right. And there have so. been so many of those things that the, the right used to take down Christine Blasey Ford, who had yes. less corroboration. I mean, uh, Tara Reid has more corroboration than Christine Blasey Ford could have ever dreamt of. Well, there was a point um, in the middle of this week where I was like, Brent, are they suggesting that we should believe that for 30 years she's been carefully telling one person at a time, let him be vice president for eight full years and only now has decided to release the sharks? Like, we're supposed to believe she conspired for 30 years telling right. her neighbor and tell, having her mom call Larry King in 1993 and like a whole bunch of things. Only right. to bring it out now after the man's run for president or try to like every year of our lives for the last yeah. 100 decades? Right. Like and that's that, what they want to, that's what their story asks us to believe. Right. And, and I, it has been so, that's what was so deeply upsetting about this week was that it be, because first off, he was silent for way too long. I mean, he was yeah. silent for a while. So if we're going back to when this, when she first said this on that podcast with Katie Halper, I mean, we're talking about like the, like pushing two months now at this point. Yeah. Um, but at least since it, like we started getting a corroborating evidence, that was really sort of like about two weeks ago. And then last weekend, we gave you the evidence of, you know, the Larry King interview. I think the very next day was the day that her neighbor came out. It was the day that I think the podcast was released. Yeah. Um, and so, and then he spent the rest of the week saying nothing other than giving out some talking points to his surrogates, which were then later in the week. Uh, disputed by the New York Times because, and we heard this actually, Stacey Abrams was one of the yeah. ones who was like, the New York Times looked into this and they found that nothing happened. And the New York Times finally on either Friday or Saturday was like, by the way, stop saying that because we didn't say that. Yeah. Like they found that they couldn't prove that it did happen, but they also found like a lot of things that were like weird about the story. Like they, yeah. they reported that there were a bunch of interns. She oversaw the interns at the time. All of the interns were like, yeah, we remember that she just like wasn't there one day all of a sudden. And then we never heard from her and we never were told why she left. So like, 
yes, there were a lot of people who the New York Times interviewed who were like, we don't think anything like that happened and we don't remember anything that like, are being told or like anything, you know, whatever. But like there were people who were just sort of like something weird happened. So I like the, to, New York, the New York Times even had to be like, by the way, stop using these shady talking points. But besides that, it was the whole week where like, because look, who was obviously going to be questioned about this? While Joe surrogates. Biden, his surrogates and his women surrogates specifically. <laughs> and it was so disgusting to me. And it wasn't even there. I mean, it sort no, of was, but this it wasn't is, even it's there. They're at all. also in the sea that we're swimming in. Right, exactly. Because this and it's is not what fair. you are called upon to do as a female politician right. to keep your fucking job. Right. His, his silence all week was its own form of sexual harassment. Yeah. Because it was the Kirsten Gillibrands of the world who had to figure out what the hell they were going to say while he was like sitting hunkered in a corner of his basement. And that's a lot of the female politicians that got asked about this. And I also want to point out, I can't think of a single male politician whose reputation has been destroyed by this. But no. we're all furious, rightfully furious, at some of these women for using talking points that have been used for years to discredit women. I mean, Gretchen totally. Whitmer came out today and said that, you know, it isn't consistent with the Joe Biden she knows. And it's like, well, there were women that Harvey Weinstein did not rape in his life. There are women who could truthfully right. tell you that this is not consistent with the Harvey Weinstein they know. Right. He was and that wouldn't be them lying. By the way. Yeah, that Harvey wouldn't be Weinstein. them lying. That would be them not being the women that were raped. Right. What you know of Joe Biden has nothing to do with anything. And no, that's a doesn't. talking point that I thought we had learned to stop using. Right, I was going to say, movement. I was going to say, there were a lot of, you know, I'm sure a lot of friends of Brett Kavanaugh probably thought he was a very upstanding member of society. Bill Cosby had a secretary who didn't seem to know anything about any of this, <laughs> but that doesn't mean he wasn't drugging women. I, that's, like, if you haven't been raped by somebody, then that doesn't mean that they've never raped anyone. It just <laughs> means that you yourself, kudos to you for not being assaulted, great. Yeah. But like, that doesn't change anything about anything. Um, yeah. And I think the, the fact that, first of all, it's funny that it's not consistent with the Joe Biden they know, because it's very consistent with the Joe Biden everyone else in the public knows which is the Joe Biden that couldn't apologize to Anita Hill, that questioned her the way he did in the first place, that has been accused numerous times of violating women's boundaries in the past. Like, this is very consistent with the Joe Biden the public knows. So I don't know why we're trying to pretend it's not consistent with Gretchen <laughs> Whitmer's Joe Biden. Um, or like Stacey Abrams is Joe. Like, I believe right. that Joe Biden maybe has been nothing but respectful to Stacey Abrams and Gretchen Whitmer. And sure. that would be... I, I am in no way suggesting in suggesting that maybe he has not been respectful to everyone that he hasn't been respectful to those two. And these are not mutually yeah. exclusive stories. So yeah. the using those talking points, which are designed to discredit one woman's story, yeah. um, is incredibly cynical. And we saw women paraded out all over network news this week to do that. And it was yeah. female politicians who were asked about it. Male politicians were not asked about it. Male politicians yeah. who consider themselves allies to women did not get to have, you know, did not get put in a position where they were asked about it. And it was Joe Biden that put these women in this position. It's like Brent said, it's all part of the problem. Yeah. Um, but we're also like, <clears throat> people are not handling this break well. People, some people are, in, yeah. I know some people in very deep denial about it. I, uh, who, who are, who are, Democrats who would consider themselves feminists who are using, you know, like decidedly anti-feminist arguments to justify or to discredit Tara Reid and to justify Joe Biden's, you know, like categorical um, denial of it. Right. Uh, and that's very concerning to me. Um, and I think, you know, I think that we need to get to a place where at the very least, we can all say, we can all act with the presumption that we can't know for sure. Well, right. That's the other thing, because even, you know, Nancy Pelosi, I saw her get asked about it at some press conference and said that she um, believes Joe Biden. And then also, you know, in the same sentence, talked about how we have to give people due process, which was a yeah. big thing that like everybody was talking about, you know, during the Kavanaugh hearing that he was deserved due process. And he ultimately got it in a Senate hearing. Uh, nobody seemed to care about that Senate hearing because right. um, everybody just voted in the way that they were already going to vote in the first place. But like, you know, you can't say, I believe Joe Biden, and then also talk about due process, because that means what you're, because then you're saying that you don't believe her, basically. Right. So it's like, that also, that argument also goes both 
ways. Like I can get that you like don't want to immediately just be like, okay, well, yes, Joe Biden did that 100%. But you also shouldn't use the same smear tricks that people have been using against women since the beginning of time. And there's also, you have to, inherent in here is a power imbalance that you can't pretend doesn't exist. So when we, when we act like, you know, we, when we act like we believe Joe Biden, we're also resting on the side of power. And that means that someone like Tara Reid has way fewer options for telling her truth than he does. Yeah. And way, I mean, as we've seen, because MSNBC has not had her on to talk to her about the accusation. Yeah. Um, so you also have to recognize that, like, just as Brent and I do not know that this happened, and would not, I don't think, suggest that we know that for any sort, with any sort of certainty. No. Um, but I, we certainly wouldn't know with any sort of certainty whether it didn't happen either. <laughs> and like, yeah. the, the, because of that, everyone's responses to it are incredibly important. And I don't see, and this is a consistent issue with Joe Biden, I don't see him learning from this moment ever. You know, when, especially when it comes to these sorts of you know, issues around gender, you don't see him learning from these moments. He's been in these moments before. He was in this moment when they asked him to apologize to Anita Hill and he couldn't fucking do it. Right. Um, he's, so he's, he's faced this music before to some extent and has never yeah. learned from the moment. And right. then on top of that, we don't give Tara Reid a chance to learn from the moment because we're not giving her any fair airing of her story either. We have a bunch of people who claim that they're feminists but like are disputing that she would know what happened in her own assault. Yeah. Like. It, well, that's what even in that even in that interview with Biden on MSNBC, they did not bring up the corroborating evidence. They didn't yeah. press him on the fact that multiple people had said this. That was yeah. that was never presented to him as, you know. And if we're going to use people working there at the time and not remembering this as a as a criteria that disputes that it happened, I know. then I mean, then good luck ever being believed about anything in your life <laughs> because someone in the room wasn't listening. I mean, it's like, I, my, my cousin has a new boyfriend and my mother has asked me 18 times what he does for a living. And she has told me at least five times and I have forgotten every single time. <laughs> and so I, if, if there was like a pop quiz on what he does for a living, I would fail that pop quiz despite having both been told and asked <laughs> repeatedly, had this information highlighted to me. Like sometimes you're just in a room and you don't retain what happened. Yeah. That's also a real thing that happens to people. It so um, yeah. here's the thing though, you guys. Do you think this is just going to sort of quietly go away? I think that has been so many people's hopes. Then think again. Delusional hopes. There's no group of people better prepared to run a smear campaign based entirely on hypocrisy than the GOP. Right. I mean, because now is, suddenly Mitch McConnell cares. Oh, for sure. Yes. I mean, of course he cares a lot. Doesn't right. care about Donald Trump's supposed rapes. And by the way, Donald Trump has committed worse acts than this by far and repeatedly to, to the extent that he has tens of accusers as opposed right. to under 10 accusers. Um, so if you're going to be concerned about Joe Biden's dalliances, please also be concerned about Donald well, Trump. right. I mean, yes. Like Mitch McConnell. Yeah. Like the, that's because, so he, um, he was on Fox and was asked whether Biden's papers at the University of Delaware should be released so that they could get more information about the assault. And he said, when you run for president of the United States, your life is an open book. And I can't mm -hmm. imagine that Vice President Biden isn't going to have to participate in releasing all of the information related to the allegations. This from a man who's supporting a candidate whose tax returns we have. Tax, I was just about to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you oh, think this man. is going away, it's not <laughs> because there's no bottom to their hypocrisy. But no. also, fuck off, Mitch McConnell. Yeah, for I sure. Mean, if you were concerned about this for the right reasons, then sure, join the <laughs> right. team. But you're not. You're an asshole. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he. But that I think is that is the problem with the Democrats' response to this because, like, yes. it, it is because exactly what you just said about Mitch McConnell can now be said by the Republicans about how the Democrats acted in their attempt to not have Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. Exactly. So you we have totally. you in in this story here you lose. And like, look, it's politics. Nobody has moral high ground. Right. Um, but <laughs> if anybody did in this story, in the Me Too movement, if it anybody did, us. it should have been us and now we don't. Yeah. That's, and, and we have the more recent less high ground too. Like, right. we're going to be the, this is going to be the lack of high ground that's remembered in the election. This is the one that just happened. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, Incredibly troubling that the DNC fell into this trap so easily. Yeah. 
And also but, incredibly troubling that they're doubling down on it. I was going to say, but <laughs> it's okay, though, guys. Nothing because to see we're here. Good. No, we're good. Yeah. Tom Perez says we're fine. So he would know. We are. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Yeah. Tom he Perez, is... by the way, controls the weather, too. So <laughs> sure. there's not going to exactly. be hurricanes anymore, either. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so on Saturday, the New York Times editorial board, board called Biden's denial of the um, assault insufficient, and they urged the DNC to form an, a, quote, unbiased, apolitical panel to look into the matter. That's the New York Times, by the way. This is fascinating, by the way, because also the New York Times did not endorse him in the primary. And so That's the right. New York Times is in a weird well, they position. Endorsed the, they endorsed the two women. Exactly. The New York Times is in a weird position where a candidate that they were not enthusiastic about is the candidate. And they're, he's in line with their thinking. Like they, they're not troubled by Joe Biden's platform. Yeah. And they're also in bed with all of his people because that's what the, they are part of the establishment to some extent. But, right. um, but they are now in an awkward <clears throat> position where it was their incompetence that broke the story. It was their lack right. of transparency that broke this whole story. And so what? now they have to, in order to maintain their own credibility, they have to be demanding of the DNC in a way that they don't like. Right. And but this anyway, has Tom, become awkward. Right. Yeah, exactly. It has. But Tom Perez got asked about that, and he said that the suggestion was absurd. He said, there's been so many investigations of the vice president. The most comprehensive investigation of the vice president was when he was vetted by Barack Obama in 2008. If Barack Obama had any indication there was an issue, Barack Obama would not have had him as vice president. Barack Obama trusted Joe Biden. I trust Joe Biden. And those investigations have been done. So he just also, said Barack Obama. Also Barack Obama. <laughs> That's he just right. wanted to remind Which us about Barack Obama. what Joe Biden Obama. himself is doing. So they've, they've clearly on the same page on that front. Yeah. Their, their messaging for 2020 is Barack Obama. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, this is not a meaningful... That doesn't make any sense. I mean, I get that he probably was vetted, but like, sure. obviously, like, this, this specific accusation had not been brought forward right. into the public because like it sort of like needed the Me Too movement to exist before yeah. it would even So I was going to say 2008 anyway. has so nothing was, to do with 2020. Right. So there's no way that Joe Biden, and I guess all of his documents were not at the University of Delaware at the time because he was still in the Senate at the time, but like there's no way that like Joe Biden was like, hey, I'm not going to tell you what this is about, but have the National Archives look for Tara Reid records like in their, right. like, you know, so it's like to say that that vetting process of Biden uh, during 2008 should like assure us all that like this didn't happen is actual trash. Also, like, I would like to remind everyone off, that John Edwards was vetted to be the vice president at one point. <laughs> That's true. Like vetting is not like foolproof. Sometimes things, Sarah Palin was the vice presidential candidate, yeah, like, by the way. <laughs> sometimes things come up and you, you don't, I mean, sometimes things don't come up and you don't find out about them, in, yeah. even in a vetting process. Yeah. Um, and certainly things that are a response to a mass movement that has only occurred in response to Donald Trump right. could not have been on the top of their list in 2008. Because yeah. let me tell you a <clears throat> sad secret about Congress. I feel like we'd be hard pressed to find a member of the Senate who hasn't done something inappropriate to someone who's been, at least someone who's been in the Senate that long, yeah. who hasn't been, hasn't been inappropriate with someone. Because as I have said again and again on this podcast, the culture of Washington in the 80s and 90s was not just dismissive of women, but it was violent towards women. Right. Well, we've got more on that later. Actually. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, no, but, but like <laughs> that's, the, the culture of Washington that he was coming out of was a culture that was violent towards women. So people yeah. who were serving at that time, people that were serving at the time that Monica Lewinsky got put in the position she got put in, were also doing similar shit because that was just allowed in Washington at the time, which yeah. we will, again, speak about later. Um, yeah. But before we get to that, yeah. there's been not much polling on this yet because it's sort of a slow breaking scandal. Right, but there but was- there's been some. Right, there was a HuffPo YouGov poll that actually came out before Biden, or was done before Biden's MSNBC interview on Friday. Um, and there are some interesting results in here, most of which I would say are bad for him, even yeah. considering that most people haven't yet heard of the story or know enough about it. So people were asked whether they uh, found the story credible or not, and 30% said that they found the allegation against Biden credible, and 17% said that they were not credible. So America, at least broadly, is understanding that we're supposed to be um, believing women. Believing women. Um, yeah. So that's, I guess, heartening. Um, and then, but the, the majority, the clear, the actual majority, 53% said that they aren't sure or haven't had enough to say, which is on the media for that, by the way. Because um, 
covering it is one of the ways that people find out about a thing to right. worry about. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what I think is more bad for him, because that I think is just a jumbled mess. Like only 30% yeah, yeah. feel one way, 17% another way, and everybody else is just sort of like, I don't know anything about this. But to get around to that question, they asked people, let's assume that they were true. Then what do you think about this? And 29% well, of voters said that it is disqualifying right. from, for Biden from the presidency. And 40% consider it relevant, but not disqualifying. Only 18% dismiss it as irrelevant. So you're looking right there at 69% of voters who think that it is either disqualifying or relevant and how they would vote. vote. And that, my friends, is how you lose a presidential election. That's right. When a vast majority of voters think that you have done something that is relevant to their vote that's negative, then not great. it's not a great way, not it's not a great way to drive turnout. It's nope. a super not great way to run an election. Nope. Um, so there has been sort of, this is another thing that I think we sort of aren't getting enough perspective on because A, we're all stuck in our homes 24 hours a day. B, we are acting, we've acted like the presidential primary has just been sewn up and everything's right. over. And we're um, canceling primaries. And we're canceling primaries as if there's no reason for them. Um, is that we're still pretty early in the process. We're not anywhere near the date we would have been having our convention and officially selecting our candidate. And right. we're certainly not anywhere near the date that a candidate would traditionally choose a, a running mate. Right. Um, As so you said last week, game, but it's I not. can't remember if you said this on the podcast or you just said this to me one night when we were ranting and raving on a Zoom call um, <laughs> before watching Merit at First Sight. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, us, California, the biggest state in the union, had not yet even voted at this point in the election yeah. cycle in 2016. That's right. Yeah, that's, we are at a point right now where in 2016, Brent and I had not yet cast a vote. Right. Um, and so it feels like because everyone sort of galvanized around somebody early that we are kind of out of time, but we're not out of time. Anything could still happen. And that's really the most optimistic thought I can muster in this moment is that we actually yeah. like don't know what's going to happen. Um, yeah. But so here's what happens if it turns out that this, if here's the thing, Biden doesn't have to be the one to think that he shouldn't run. Party, the party elite, the super delegate class is who totally. gets to really decide that. Right. And if the party elite decide that they can't justify supporting him because they too are running for office or they too have right. you know, kingdoms to protect, um, then they're, Biden doesn't actually have enough delegates to win yet. So the whole thing is still no. open. The, the game is still open. And I don't think they actually give a shit about him either. No, they, they decided, here's what happened. They decided, A, how do we keep the corporate money? We have to pick somebody who will take the corporate money. So we gotta find, right. we gotta find a compromise. He's everyone's second choice. He'll be fine. Yeah. We all know him. We all love him. Like, right. that it, we, we can't trust a Pete Buttigieg. He's a wild card. We can't trust Amy Klobuchar. She's a woman. Liz Warren is a progressive. But, you know, they, they got everyone else out of the race in order to galvanize around everyone's second choice. And right. nobody, because if he was doing so hot, in the first place, then he would have been winning more primaries early on. He would have had more momentum, momentum early on, and he would have a ground game in some state somewhere. Right. <laughs> Currently, he has no campaign operation. No. He's, his, the election no is for him by party <laughs> elites, essentially, because they've just gotten everyone else to drop out. But there's, yeah. no, there's no election strategy going on there. They don't give a shit who the candidate is as long as they get to keep their money. This well, is right. about moderates I, not wanting to lose access to their moderation. I agree. Like, and what has been so frustrating about this, and, and we have been saying this ever since South Carolina happened, and then the dropouts that happened on Sunday and Monday prior to Super Tuesday. What has bo always bothered me about his candidacy, and like I have toyed with coming around just, you know, as you know, we've had yeah. numerous debates about it amongst ourselves. Right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what has always been so troubling to me is that it was such nobody actually really cared that it was Biden nobody yeah. even the DNC people even I would say probably anywhere between 50 and 100 percent of the people who voted for him yeah. what they cared about was that the nominee wasn't Bernie Sanders yeah. and look fine like you didn't want Bernie Sanders you didn't want a socialist at the top of the ticket I'll give you that like as right. much as I sort of like can think that you are wrong about whether Bernie Sanders can win a national election. I think he can. You think he can't? Fine. Like, that's right. a reasonable thing for you to be thinking, even though I disagree with you. But, right. like, they had a very clear plan that was well calculated, that involved 
all of the presidential candidates, regardless of whether they were a progressive or a moderate or a conservative or whatever, it involved past presidents. It involved the entire DNC uh, operation. Like they had a clear plan, but the plan wasn't ever who was going to be the best candidate in November. The plan was never that they loved Joe Biden so much and thought Joe Biden deserved to be the president. Yeah. The plan was never that. The plan was never who can best beat Donald Trump. The plan was end Bernie Sanders, and we'll worry about the rest of this later. And the problem is we're now having to worry about it later. Yeah. And it doesn't look good. Well, I mean, but the but as but a plan enacted by the loseriest losers, the most pro losing group of right. people on the planet, the, that, would that, would have this problem. Right, that plan to win the primary for Biden was the best plan that the DNC has ever enacted in the history of the organization. That's right. And now they're left with the spoils they're out of, of that plan, and they've realized that maybe that was a shit plan. Yeah, well, and it's but, like. It also, they enacted the plan so efficiently that they finished the plan too early for the plan to actually take effect. Like, I think right. that's what is going on here. I think it is not beneficial for a low enthusiasm candidate like Joe Biden to be left hanging out in the wind for eight months while we all have to learn more and more about him. You don't <laughs> want people to know more about Joe. You want people to only briefly be affiliated, to, to briefly know about him in passing and nothing more detailed than that. Right. He's not the kind of candidate that you want a thorough vetting of. You know right. that going in. If that's your game and you're gonna fix everything for Joe Biden, I would contend they could have accomplished that a, a less, a, a way that didn't discredit their own process. Um, yeah. Because he was already, once they orchestrated that move on Super Tuesday, he was gonna probably get enough delegates to win. Sanders was probably not gonna win the nomination. And they were probably then gonna be able to be like, look, Sanders people, you tried, good for you. Welcome to the tent. But instead they elected to sort of thwart their own process by, you know, kind of by creating a dynamic where even Sanders was pressured to get out of the race because it's supposedly the most important election of our lifetime and we all needed all hands on deck. And then dropped everything in the lap of a campaign organization that had no plan, no ground game, and no people. <laughs> of, you know, of a candidate who had That's no true. platform yeah. and of a party organization that had no way to protect him from the onslaught of problems that, we're, that he's gonna face as a candidate because we, back when we thought he was gonna be the winner, we were steeped in a sea of burisma that we were never gonna emerge from because Joe Biden was the candidate that ha was gonna face the most oppo research trouble of all the candidates. So yeah. they knew about him going in and they right. still elected to push him through and they pushed him through so efficiently that now we have four more months than we should ever have had to get to right. know Joe. And do you wanna know what? On top of all of that, if there's one thing that we know about the, the Joe Biden experience is that he is a terrible, terrible, terrible candidate for president. Yeah. Uh, He's been trying for years. Been trying He's for given us numerous. Pushing 40 years, been trying to be yeah. the president and has never once, well, this is the first time that he's ever won a damn primary. And yeah. we're supposed to think that like, he's gonna be the one to save us from Donald Trump. I mean, yikes, yeah. people. Yeah, no, I, it's like, they put all of their, they, they organized to put all of their eggs in the worst basket. Yes. And then well, and that's we're what talk you and I were talking earlier, er, you and I were talking earlier this week and it's just sort of like, I didn't realize at the time when all of this was happening, sort of like looking back now, it's almost like, oh God, I could have tolerated an Amy Klobuchar candidate. I know. Like once they're sort of like the exact same person politically, like at least she hasn't sexually assaulted anyone and is also speaking in complete sentences. Yeah. Um, you know, like ditto Pete Buttigieg. Uh, yeah, no, you know, like, like some of these people who I just sort of like had such like vehement hatred for and like, well, hatred's the wrong word. I didn't right, hate them. But I mean like, you know, like didn't think that they were the right people. Right at this time that we're living in right now. Supporters of their candidacy. Like, oh my God, how much but would I pine for an Amy Klobuchar at the top of the ticket right now? For I think sake. the schism that we're seeing right now, because I was actually having a conversation about this with a friend who's progressive, but she's more kind of vote blue no matter who than I am. Um, and she was like, yeah, I mean, you know, Biden wouldn't, was not my first choice, of course, but like, he's not my last choice. And I was like, I need you to understand something, which is that if you are the kind of voter who votes on the far left, 
Biden was your last choice. He was your last choice. So for me, for you, he's just one of the choices. For me, he was my last choice. So this is not a compromise choice for me. This is Amy Klobuchar, who I dislike immensely as a politician, was not my last choice. And I would have had an easier time coming around to Amy Klobuchar, like you're saying. But Biden, for the left, was our last choice. So, I mean, they, this is a bold move that the middle pulled because they were betting on the far left whose votes they need coming around to not one of their least favorite choices, but their literal bottom of the barrel last choice. Right. And this is, I mean, Brent and I are also people who went and saw every single candidate speak. So we're not yes. just people who are like flailing around just being angry at nonsense. We, we went and heard everyone pitch us. Yeah. Um, and, and you, and, and, from even those experiences. Well, we, we didn't hear we Joe Biden pitch us. We just heard Joe Biden introduce people for like an hour and a half. And then right. somebody, and then one of his then supporters who was 117 had to be escorted by the EMT. But I mean, like, and then, just, and then it was even over. The, just that experience taught me how ill prepared his campaign was to handle the pressure of a national election. Because yeah. they couldn't handle the pressure of an Iowa primary. Yeah. Like, or an Iowa caucus. Like, Pete Buttigieg's campaign had an organized event that millions, and millions, thousands of people <laughs> showed up to. Sorry, I got right. carried away there. And like, <laughs> sure. they didn't know what they were doing, didn't have any real people at that event. And yet somehow okay. it was way more professional than what we witnessed with Joe Biden. So like, I mean, yeah. we're talking about pulling people to their last choice and then handing them this basket of shit that is yeah. a, a sexual assault accusation. And then hearing that it turns out we actually don't share the same moral principles right. because my moral principle is that I take these kinds of accusations very seriously and I try not to vote for candidates who are at least semi-credibly accused of these sorts of actions unless the candidate has done the right by their addressing of it. Right. So in any case, here's the thing. Here's what would happen if Biden did quit the race. Right. We don't. Out. Because it could happen. That's could literally happen. a thing that we're not saying that because we are like wildly hopeful and, you know, like optimists. The we're voices are, that. the voices are mounting. And they will the voices continue are to mounting. mount. They'll continue to mount. They're and not the going problem, to get quieter. They might get quiet at a certain point. Maybe. I don't know why. Right. No, but will, also but I mean, like, the, the enemy of those voices would be time. And we have nothing but time. Yeah. And if or, the DNC. The opposite and, of time would be a it, rush, would be rushed. Right. I, messed, I messed up that metaphor. You guys know what I was saying. And the one point that I was sort of getting at when I was talking about the DNC not caring about this guy is that the DNC cares about winning this election. And I think that they've gone yeah. about it in all of the wrong ways. But like, ultimately, right. that's what they care about. Yeah. And if this that's thing, what we all care if, about. If there is even any inkling that this thing is going to go south, then I, he's getting kicked to the curb. Well, I say that with a caveat because they are also expert losers. Well, that's there was true. an inkling that their support of Hillary Clinton would go south <laughs> and they <laughs> the election voters. So true. I, the, the issue is more if there is more than an inkling, if there's a stampede yes. that this is going south, if there's an inkling that's going south, they'll never hear it. So don't worry about that. They'll right. continue to pursue a losing strategy until they are literally like stuck with their hands strung up, like hanging right. from a, you know, hanging from a, whatchamacallit. Right. I, they push the what, most- What do you dis- hang from when you're hanging? <laughs> I don't know. I'm messing up metaphors because I'm kind of, it's hot in here, you guys. I can't. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, but we case. found it interesting because somebody asked us actually earlier this week yeah, yeah. what would happen if he dropped out and I, neither of us knew. Yeah. Um, so now we know and we're going to tell you in case you're curious. Um, So if he drops out before the convention, then the delegates would get to select a new nominee. Um, So that would sort of like make the remaining primaries much more important, depending on when it is that he dropped out. But so many primaries have been pushed because they were supposed to have taken place um, during- Mid-pandemic. During during mid-pandemic and they just haven't. And so they got pushed except the Kansas one, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, so that would be important. Um, now, interestingly, the delegates at the Democratic National Convention are free to vote their conscience on the first ball- ballot, which I didn't actually realize until now. So even Biden oh, yeah. pledged delegates could become a Sanders pledged delegate if they decided that they wanted to be a pledged delegate. That's and why the, the, when you hear that they might have worked out a deal with Sanders to give him 30% of the delegates or whatever, that's how they can do that is because Democratic delegates aren't bound. Right. The, the GOP delegates are bound delegates. Right. So if you're there as a Trump delegate from wherever, then you are a Trump delegate and that's who you're voting for and you, that's all that matters. Um, so 
it, now, if he picks a VP before the convention, which it seems like he probably will, I think he's been saying that he's going to do that in July. I mean, you always pick one before the convention because they always have like their own night and the big video that plays yeah. and then they give a big speech. And but usually you pick that. it at the end of July. <laughs> right, exactly. So if he has done that before he were to drop out, that could potentially give delegates like someone to like rally around as the actual candidate, but they wouldn't have to do that. Right. Um, certainly, like they would be not, they would not be bound to, to doing that at yeah. all. Um, and also assuming that he drops out before the convention and there are still primaries going, it seems like you would also probably see people jumping back in. I mean, nobody, I mean, anybody can run at any point, but all of these people just quote unquote suspended their campaign. Um, so any of these people could be, you would certainly see that from Sanders, who's the closest to getting the actual amount. Um, if there's a lot of primaries left, like you could see a world where he maybe gets there. Um, also, so I feel like there's maybe some misunderstanding about what it means to suspend your campaign and drop out that is being driven by this New York news and just in general, the way that we're discussing how these primaries work. All of these candidates, as long as they have gathered enough signatures to get on the ballot, are on the ballot in all of these states. Right. You can't remove people from the ballot just because they suspend. I mean, you clearly can try because New York State is trying. Andrew Yang is now suing them for trying. Um, but their voters went and collected signatures to get them on the ballot. It does, oh. You don't have to opt in to running. You have to file paperwork. But once you file the paperwork, you're not like filing other paperwork that's like take me off the ballot paperwork. Right. You know, you're you're still on the ballot. So like even though, you know, candidates dropped out like flies right before Super Tuesday, but they were all still on our ballot. And so right. that, so none of these, all these people have to do is say, never mind, I want to be the president again. And they've basically done it. Yeah. So, um, that's so yeah, no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it, 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 if he drops out right after the convention, then guess who gets to pick? Yikes, yeah. the DNC. And so that's, and we that, should really avoid that one. We should avoid that one. I think that we should avoid that one for other reasons also, because well, like if he does it after the convention, then that's a, like you would, who knows what the convention is going to look like anyway, but you also always get a bump out of a convention. Yeah. It's a good time to like actually get to know the nominee and like what their sort of like whole experience is going to, to be. Um, and so you won't get that like if you have Biden drop out after the convention. And so it, that would seem sort of like a real, mess if that happened um but also we don't want the dnc picking the candidate because that sounds dark yeah N not here for that no oh. i i think the more uh, look they've already kind of thwarted their attempt at a democratic process by goading everyone to drop out before anyone got to vote right and look i think it would have benefited i think biden would have probably won anyway in you know if they had after super tuesday certainly like i mean i don't mean before super tuesday i don't think if all of those yeah. candidates had stayed in, I don't think Biden would have won. I think that's on them to deal with their conscience about that. But yes. if they had just kept him in the race against Sanders, I'm pretty sure he would have won anyway. Yeah. And then they would have had the credibility of saying a majority of voters chose him, unlike right now, where they've decided yeah. he's already won. And the man still has something like 550 delegates to go, 600 delegates to go before he gets to the needed number of delegates. Yeah. He's hundreds of delegates from winning still. Yeah. So we're not, he's not like, you know, three delegates from winning and we're just assuming that he'll definitely get those in the coming races. Like we're, we're still at the point where he actually could not win if something happened. Right. I agree. And, and, you know, we, I pulled all of these scenarios as to like what would happen if he drops out before or after, or if there's primary still after whatever, there's a, a pretty extensive article um, in the Hill about this. And it's sort of the reason that they even sort of like got into it at all was because supposedly that there is some chatter amongst the DNC I mean, I'm, type people that this would probably just really be a lot easier right now if it wasn't Joe Biden. And, yeah. I, and I think that there, I would challenge you, if you were a Joe Biden voter, you voted for Joe Biden in the primary, to think to yourself, take yourself out of that vote, take any feelings that you have about feeling guilty of voting for him or not guilty, or like just where we are in the entire presidential process right now, yeah. And think to yourself, would we all be better off if this was literally anyone else? And I think that you would probably, at least for a fleeting moment, find the answer to be yes. Well, and also, would I be able to exercise my support for the same principles without losing my moral high ground if I right. just voted for fucking Amy Klobuchar or yeah. somebody like that. Well, that's what I think that after this whole, 
um, after this Tara Reid story here, I think that there are a lot of people on the left who might actually come around in a more wholehearted way to even another moderate. I mean, I, yeah. your mom has been actually sort of like pushing a um, Liz Warren and Julian and Castro ticket, which well, I think that's is like the obvious because, compromise. Right, right. It's like you get that's a progressive so at the top of the ticket. You also get the help with the Latino community that you've been desperately searching for because they hate Joe Biden. You know, right. I mean, like that makes sense. It like gets the left around, it gets the young people around, it gets the, it right. does everything that you want. Everyone to. So wins. I get, that. I get it. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Kudos to right. Ellen Nordstrom for pushing that theory. But I honestly think that there are a lot of people on the left who would breathe a sigh of relief with the sight of literally any other single living human. Yeah, like, I, like name any, like Cory Booker, love sure. it. Kamala Harris doesn't think anything in particular, thrilled. I mean, like, you know, Amy Klobuchar, who I have said again and again is the one moderate that I was like, look, I, on, I disagree with Amy Klobuchar on everything. But I always said during the primary, I sort of respect that she has a certain kind of charisma, first of all. And second of all, I respect that she just honestly has terrible ideas. And <laughs> she's, she's not playing a cynical politician game with me. She just has bad ideas. And right, that, she to me, them. she owns them. And that, to me, is even better than what we have here with Joe Biden. Right. Like, she's I, principled. She's incorrectly she's principled. principled. She's incorrectly <laughs> principled. Exactly. And that, that, as a lefty, I would breathe a sigh of relief because you would always know where you could find her. You yep. know, I think she, she doesn't blow with the wind. She has terrible ideas because her moral compass leads her to make bad choices. And that's, <laughs> you know, that's what, that's, I, I actually, remember when we, for our first year at Politicon, we went and saw Michelle Bachman speak. <laughs> yes. And I kind of walked out of it and I was like, oh my God, Brent, she's trying to have good ideas and her brain is broken. It's not that she hasn't tried though. Like I had thought that Isn't she that was so just funny? being a lazy thinker. Right, and but stupid, I potentially respect, stupid. Right, I respect more that she sat down and she read Burr just as I've read Burr and she just took the wrong fucking message from it. Yep. You know? Like, yeah. it, it, it just- A lot of the same people have been doing that with Ayn Rand over the years. <laughs> yes, right, and at least she tried. She read the book. It didn't compute right, but that's okay. <laughs> you know? right. It's just like, it, <laughs> it, I think something, what rankles me about what's going on now is we've been launched into this kind of extreme cynicism where somebody who doesn't have any kind of principles is being propped up by other people with no principles and their principles that they even claim to fake have are morphing in front of our eyes and they're asking us to be okay with that. And I'm just not okay with that. No, me either. But in any case, I think you're right. I think that there are a lot of moderates that the left would at least saddle up for yeah. and would, would put a show on of being medium excited about. And that was yeah. never something they were gonna get from Joe Biden. And I think that their big mistake is that because I, you know, I have a lot of friends in the Beltway, so I have a lot of friends who like see what they see. And I think they truly didn't know that about him. I don't think they've uh, been listening to the left. I think that they thought that he was the one because people loved Obama that would get the left on board. And he was like, they couldn't have picked a worse yeah. choice. I will say that the one thing that has not necessarily made me happy this week, I don't know that that's the way to say it, but I have, you know, I had been, as I mentioned, sort of toying with like whether this is something that I could stomach, yeah. um, the Biden candidacy. And now that I am back to sort of realizing that no, it is in fact not, that sits a lot better with me. <laughs> you just feel so less that's, troubled by the- that's a lot more, It's a lot more comforting sure. um, to know for certain that I don't like this. <laughs> Good. I had, been, I had been trying to make my brain do lots of different things to sort of sure. get yeah. there. And now I feel like I don't have to any longer. <laughs> yeah, it feels, it's a freeing. It's freeing. <laughs> it's freeing. It was freeing. Yes. Um, as terrible as it was on so many levels. That's right. Uh, just personally, selfishly, I am feeling much better in my disdain for Joe Biden. Yeah, well, and you also got another reason to feel better in your disdain for Joe Biden because he also uh, released his VP selection committee. Oh, God. This week. Oh, my God. Thank God we have strong progressives already showing up on the campaign. Mm, you know, yes. strong progressives like Chris Dodd, <laughs> Cynthia Hogan, Eric Garcetti, 
Lisa Blunt Rochester, all the strong progressives that we're always looking for when we when it comes to advising a candidate who has marginal, if any, support from the left. And this was a thing that, you know, you and I were talking about before this podcast, actually, when this list got released, where this, it sort of surprised me because again, going back to sort of like what I said earlier, where like sometimes these are the types of things where like Biden understands like what this thing is because it's I think Biden to a degree sort of like gets that politics is just like a fucking show oh yeah um, that I think is the, has been his saving grace this whole time right and like he's a good showman this, right and putting people on your VP selection committee it's a show like yeah, it means so nothing you just have to it means nothing like you're gonna pick who you're gonna pick these people are gonna talk to some people and they're gonna tell you their lame opinions you're gonna either listen to them or you're gonna not listen to them you probably already know who you want anyway so like this is a no this list of people that you just read is a nonsense list. It could be anybody. It could be you. It could be me. It could be. Yeah. It could be it Satan. Could, it could be, be a whatever. Tree. It could be, it could be any anyone. Right. It's nothing. So that being said, put a strong progressive on mm. this list that you aren't even going to listen to. Right. Put. You know? This is just for show. Like, it's all for me. show. Placate me. <laughs> this is like the kind of unforced errors that took down the Clinton campaign. Yes. You know, the VP selection was what took her down in the most extreme, fullest sense of the word. I because mean. before that, she was limping along. Well, and, there's a million other things also. But I mean, that was the thing where I think people on the left were like, well, I guess she doesn't want my vote. Right. I don't know care what about to say. Me. She doesn't right. care about me. And yeah. so the, all, you can make all the threats in the world, but nobody cares about me. So I'm just going to yeah. stay home. Like, I think that was the decision that kind of made clear that she just doesn't fucking care about the left. Yeah. And this is... The, this is exactly what Joe Biden did not have to do. That's, it's a totally unforced error because all he had to do was, A, know something right. that he already knows, have, which is the bullshit. Have Nina Turner happen. be one of these people or Literally anybody. You know, like, I mean, just, pick, yeah. Pick, and I was saying to Brent, like Mark Pocan, who's basically a fake progressive. I mean, he's, you know, he's one of the co-chairs of the, uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, but like, He's not right. so but he's also from Wisconsin. I'm, like he's right. the type of person who could also get on board with Amy Klobuchar being the vice president, right. even he though she's not a progressive. Like, yeah, somebody just, just anybody just give me lip service. Anybody, fake people, <laughs> make up a person. It doesn't like <laughs> at the point that you are doing theater, do it right. Yeah. As so, I mean, yep. this is a criticism I have of Kim Jong Un that we're going to talk about later. <laughs> but it's like. If you are a person who inherently understands what is and is not political theater, know, know how to uh, commit to the theatrical right? if you need to. And then the other thing that's an unforced error is if you are a person with Me Too problems, certainly don't appoint any advisors and certainly no one on this high profile committee that is also a person with a Me Too problem because Chris Dodd is one of the most Me Tooiest members of the Senate that there is. Right. And this is when we referenced earlier that we were going to talk about the sort of, you know, uh, the what was going on in Washington in the 80s and 90s. And I said, more on that Chris later. Chris Dodd could tell you. This is the more on that later. It's yeah. the Chris Dodd portion of this uh, here, because he is a well-known, um, you know, Me Too problem haver. Yeah. Uh, like this has been reported extensively. Um, yeah, he was, Dodd, him and Ted Kennedy were like out hitting the town together in the 80s. Right, Dodd um, was Ted Kennedy's specific, like, known wingman. Right. And they, um, there was a 1990 profile of Ted Kennedy that GQ actually republished in 2016. Um, and it's a story about, like, how Dodd and Kennedy manhandled this waitress at this restaurant in Washington, D.C. And yeah. got caught doing it. Like, manhandled um, enough that she had bruises. Yes, it alleged that Kennedy and Dodd had the waitress pinned between them on a chair until other staff intervened and she was, yeah, she was left bruised. Um, the uh, assault um, was, uh, the person she who called reported, it, right, she called it shocking and vulgar. Right. Um, there was also like, I think Ted Kennedy like had her pushed up against Dodd and then was like rubbing his genitals on her. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this woman specifically, when she, was interviewed on Thursday. Um, her name is uh, Gaviglio. Carla Gaviglio. Yeah. Was interviewed on Thursday when they released the list of people who were going to be betting Biden's VP, VP. And she was like, I never received an apology from Chris Dodd. Yeah. <laughs> like, and there's also stories about when he dated Carrie Fisher briefly, and there were stories about the two of them being inappropriate with her. 
Yeah, I, Carrie Fisher in her book, in one of her yeah. books after she had dated him said that, described a story where she was at dinner with Kennedy and a date. Um, so they were like on a double date and uh, Dodd, oh, and Kennedy asked her, so do you think you'll be having sex with Chris at the end of this date? And Dodd looked at her with, quote, an unusual grin hanging on his very flushed face. Ugh. Gross. But like, By the way, this is a guy oh. with a reputation as a party boy from this right. exact era that's exactly. problematic. And also this is some of the great vetting that's going on, by the way, if you're wondering what, what having been vetted in the past means, it's nothing because Chris Dodd was clearly vetted to join this committee. Right, exactly. And you wanna know what? It's no surprise probably that Chris Dodd is number two in, on the list of people who have received the most campaign cash from Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, right they behind, partied together. Right, right behind Barack Obama. They have partied together. Yeah. They ran in the same circle. Yeah. Harvey Weinstein ran in the same circle as Chris Dodd. So yeah. that's Don't. some of the great, like, that's like unforced errors. That, he does not need to be on your VP selection committee. Nobody does. There are roughly 1 million other senators Man. that you can choose. Ex senators, Man. fake senators, babies, anyone. <laughs> there are other Chris's you could choose. Chris Murphy would be a good, person to totally. be on this committee people yeah. love chris murphy like just, just any other people anyone else totally but here we are hey. he's mess. sticking big mess sticking his you know sticking know. his middle finger at us <laughs> i was as, gonna say mike i don't know where I'm you're going back with this to another metaphor problem <laughs> uh, he's, what i was trying to say is he's giving us the finger as he gives us the finger like they, like <laughs> Yeah, I got you. I'm following. Yeah. Uh -huh. In any case. Yeah. On to happier topics. Yes. Um, turns out you can vote by mail. Sir. In a, in a primary. And it turns out that Kansas was the state to show us this. And Kansas blew us out of the water for many reasons. And look, we're not here. Like, Joe Biden won this overwhelmingly. So we're not here to say that you can't blow us out of the water with an election that Joe Biden wins. Totally. These are Joe Biden voters that blew us out of the have water. Have an election. You know what? He probably would have blown Sanders out in the New York primary also. Yeah. We're not no, even disputing I that. We're disputing living in an autocracy, That's really, right. is what we're disputing living in. Um, so here are three things about the Kansas primary. A, they held it. They held it by <laughs> mail because that's democracy. Yep. So that's a note to New York. Yep. Um, they did it entirely by mail and it worked. So that's yep. a note to America. And it was a ranked choice election. And that's yep. a note to just all of us. Personally. Everyone. Yeah. Because Joe Biden won overwhelmingly probably because other candidates did not have enough support and he's everyone's second choice. Yeah. So great, but he, they proved he, their point. Right. He was everyone's second choice at a certain point anyway. I mean, like, yeah. I feel like the, the ranked choice voting I think is important to think about because A, this is another thing that Yang was out. Yang has been doing everything right, basically. He's suing yeah. the state in New York. And then he was also talking about the joys of ranked choice voting. If we had ranked choice voting in this primary, I could almost tell you with unequivocal certainty that the nominee right now would be Elizabeth Warren. Yes, exactly. Yes, totally. And, and do you know how great everyone would feel about that right now? Everyone. 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 We'd all be, we'd all have done it together. Yeah. We'd have unity. We'd yep. have, we'd have a candidate we all felt good about. Yep. Even people who hate her politics would feel good that she was the candidate. And it also allows people to sort of sleep at night. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. it'll let, you know, there's a, Maine has ranked choice voting right now. Yeah. And there is a very strong green candidate running yeah. in the Maine Senate race. And you know what? It also allows people to not be frantic about that. It allows Democrats right. to not have a, you know, be going a, a level of insane that we're going to talk about later when we talk about third right. party candidates going on right now. Well, and also the, the people of Maine against their go, own potential well, voters. Right, exactly. The people of Maine can go and vote for Lisa Savage as their first choice because she's the one who believes in Medicare mm -hmm. for all. And then they can vote for their lame, whatever, you know, moderate DNC hackish yeah, the person Sarah they can vote for as, yeah. their, as their second person. And then everybody gets to sleep well at night. And the Democrat probably, at least hopefully in Maine, still gets to win. Right. But like, that's the joy of the ranked choice voting. So like anybody who doesn't think that it's a good idea should just look at all of the places that it's doing great and wonderful things for everyone. That's right. It didn't, it didn't hurt Joe Biden's chance. So if you're a DNC well, hack say, and you're worried about ranked choice voting, it's like, obviously like it didn't matter. Let him win fair and square. Yeah, It doesn't exactly. do him any favors to not. And no. 
we'd all feel better if he fucking won fair and square. Yeah. You know, I, even those of us that don't particularly like him would feel better if he won fair and square. Yeah. I, I think that they're sort of misjudging the extent to which it's really hard to get the left on board when not only is the candidate not to their liking, but you haven't had a fair election. Well, that's the and, thing. In 2016, it was all of the superdelegates who decided before there was right. actually one vote cast that it was going to be Clinton. And in 2020, you know, the DNC said that they were going to stay out. And I'm sure that they are going to be able to say on a technicality, they did stay out because it was the voters right. who decided. But, but certainly it was actually, having it was an their... ex-president call every candidate right. and demand that they drop out of the race was not exa exactly the party elite right. staying out. It was still a coordinated effort on the part of the DNC to yeah. make sure that it wasn't Sanders that won. So like they can't actually really say that. They might try, but they... Right can't say it with a straight face anyway um but well they will yeah, say it with a straight so, face but they shouldn't yeah they shouldn't exactly but um, anyway good work kansas yeah, and everybody no, else and take a fucking note here's also an important note for you is this news article that we got this from sort of made it sound like guess what bernie sanders was on the ballot even though he ended his campaign but you know who else was on the ballot everyone because right. everyone was on the ballot yeah, everywhere tulsi gabbard every was on the ballot. yeah tulsi gabbard was on the ballot Liz warren was on the ballot yeah. all of, and and here's where i think it's valid to hold an election even if only Joe Biden's on the ballot because uncommitted was on the ballot. Yeah. So That's, you can still make you your can voice cast an affirmative vote for not Joe Biden, even if he's the only one on the ballot. And that is valuable yeah. because it's all well and good if he's the only credible candidate. And so he gets all the votes, but what if 80% of the people don't, you know, <laughs> just don't like him, you right. know, that's how you find out that you don't have enough voters to get yourself elected. Um, so, you know, they also, they got a huge turnout because they sent the ballots to every registered voter. We're going to be doing that in California for the general. And that is, or at least in LA, that's what they're going to do. And that is what everyone should do. Yep. Because you get, and I also feel like the one thing that I think the left would not be mad if more turnout didn't lead to the candidates they prefer, because they would be happy that there was big turnout. The I think absolutely. Like, about turnout. And so- that's why these innovations that minimize the voter out, you know, that, that minimize the number of voters, these things where you make the, you know, we, I, I like a big primary because I want everyone to go and be excited about someone. I, I, my concern is A, that, you know, I have preferred candidates, but my secondary concern is just, I'm excited when more people vote. And so anything that improves turnout and improves everyone's ability to participate is something that you can get the left on board with. Yeah. That's the exactly. thing you can use to get the left. It's like yeah. they're failing at everything because they haven't, thought of the, the things that actually matter to the voters that they're not going to just get out of, you know, yeah. out of it by assumption. So <clears throat> in any case, um, yeah. didn't bring Biden much closer to the goalpost. Kansas only has 39 delegates, but yeah. it, it got him there. And sure. Yeah, exactly. Ranked choice voting. People love yeah. it. People and also, it. you know, the Trump campaign has been asked about this because, you know, they were asked about it around the time of Wisconsin. They were asked about it. They've just been, they've a been asked about it because who knows what's going to be going on in November around here, whether we're going to be wanting to do in-person voting. And he is, of course, talking about how, you know, oh, there's fraud with uh, mail-in voting, which there's no evidence of at all. Like yeah. many states have been doing ranked choice, or not ranked choice, excuse me, um, uh, uh, vote by mail for for years, yeah, decades. Washington even, State, in the sense you of, have like, to Washington. vote by mail. Right, exactly. So like, and these are not places where we find voter fraud. So um, anyway, the Trump is having a town hall, I think probably as we record this, I actually am recording into my phone. So I'm seeing a text message that just came through from Grant Sloss, who sent us- Friend of the this, podcast. Right, who sent us the, um, a photo of where they're doing the town hall and they're literally doing it in front of like the Lincoln Memorial. Like, oh, out yeah, the doors. shot is crazy. I actually saw it right, I saw the shot right, right before we started recording and it's like, Kudos to whoever thought of that. Uh, no. Whoever set up no. that shot is a fucking genius. Yeah, totally. Um, but it's they're so gonna, over the top. The people who are watching that are going to be getting some interesting commercials tonight because yes. a, a GOP group, Republicans for the Rule of Law, who has been trashing Trump on the airwaves, left, right, and center. Yeah. Um, uh, they're sort of like a never Trump group, but they're still sort of like they yeah, always make Bill a, Crystal is one of the founding. Right, they always make a big point of talking about that they're Republicans. Right, like, how Republican they so, right, are. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, they're launching a campaign to promote expanded voting options in November, specifically vote by mail. And they are doing their kickoff ad tonight, and it's going to air for the first time during um, Trump's town hall on Fox News. That's time. the free market for you, you guys. There it is. There Capitalism. it is. <laughs> Capitalism. Um, and yeah, and there, theirs is in favor of creating an absentee ballot system that we can all use to not die yeah. of coronavirus like everyone in Wisconsin is. 
uh, because they now have 52 poll workers who have tested positive for COVID. Yep. Um, so people are literally going to die because they held that election. Yep. I mean, that was the, I mean, there was that um, onion thing uh, that happened right after Wisconsin where they said um, voters given um, free uh, headstones. Oh, yeah, voting I instead voted. Of, <laughs> instead, of, instead of stickers. Right. And that was um, funny because true. it was true and funny right. because it was sad. Um, but we now know, in fact, that that was more real than we wanted it to be. That's right. Um, so we can't be having that. We can't be killing people to vote. No. Um, if that's, already, that's the ultimate poll tax, and those are le not legal. Right. We've already decided that we're going to pe kill people in favor of capitalism. Right. More on that later. Right. <laughs> um, exactly. But um, we, we can't be killing people for practicing democracy. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, meanwhile, every few years, and once a year, twice a year, we are forced to remind the internet that just because Donald Trump is terrible, it doesn't mean that W was not also terrible. Right, just because you saw Michelle Obama hug George W. Bush doesn't mean that their friendship should be interpreted as you- uh, Thinking he was a good president. Thinking that George W. Bush wasn't the worst president of all time up until 2016. Yeah. That's right. The worst president in modern history is still George W. Bush, or the worst ex-president in modern history is still George W. Bush, <laughs> right. because Donald Trump is still the president. And also they can both just be ba bad. Right. We don't have to accept, we don't have to pretend that things were great under W because they're bad under Trump. They're just, yeah. They've been bad wholesale. It's just been bad times. Yeah. And so W shared a three minute video on Twitter yesterday, on Saturday, urging Americans to act in unity. Yes. And talking about how we should all face this thing right. together. Remember how small our differences are in the face right. of this shared threat. Trump took that as a personal attack on him. <laughs> Which is and hilarious because it wasn't really. I mean, it had nothing to do with him. Um, <laughs> and then tweeted about how Bush had failed to support him during the impeachment trial. <laughs> and then also tagged um, a Fox News anchor, Pete Hegseth, uh, in the tweet, oddly, and said, oh, by the way, by spelled B-Y-E. He still has spelling problems on Twitter. Um, I appreciate the message from former President Bush, but where was he during impeachment calling for putting part or where was he during impeachment for ca uh, calling for putting partisanship aside? And then he tweeted at Fox and Friends, he was nowhere to be found in speaking up against the greatest hoax in American history. And of course, <laughs> he capitalized the Asian hoax because of course, <laughs> hoax in American history is apparently the proper noun for what happened. Oh um, man. Listen, the Bushes don't love Trump and we know that. Yeah. They've, a, a few of them have gone on the record. They have been critical of him, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but what this conversation caused people to do, unfortunately, was look back with rose-colored glasses at how much better things were under W. <laughs> and here's just a newsflash for everyone. They weren't. <laughs> right. We had a major terrorist attack that killed thousands of people. We had Hurricane Katrina, which displaced thousands of people. We went to war and still aren't out. Right. Dick Cheney was the vice president. Right. If you recall. And I feel like now is an important time also to remember what the DNC answer was to one term of George W. Bush. It was right. an old, boring Senate, white, male, moderate, who couldn't excite anyone if they tried. But did and, allow and, to, did get, um, did get uh, oppo researched into us creating the term swift voting yeah. which was just an example of how incompetent they were at messaging basically because they took yeah. someone who had no qualities that anyone right. could have objected to or not objected to and managed to vil vilify him over his war record so right anyway just keep that in the back of your mind as you yeah. contemplate the joe biden experience that's right i keep calling it the ex joe biden experience i love it I guess, it looks like the joe rogan experience <laughs> <laughs> like you've started a <laughs> it's like you've started like a weird, like, it's like the name of like a weird podcast where you just rant about Joe Biden, <laughs> which is sort of what this podcast I is. I was going to say, I'm sure. So this should, podcast that, might we, become the Joe Biden experience. I was going to say, we've been contemplating renaming it at, off and on over the years. Right. Um, so. I feel like. Maybe this, that's it. The Joe Biden experience is certainly the name for this episode. <laughs> Nothing else. Um, in any case, it's. It's exciting actions like those taken by Donald Trump to be angry at W that are right. causing some polling issues for him. Some of the other actions include him telling us to in, 
to disinfect ourselves by swallowing bleach and or somehow having <laughs> internal UV light disinfect us. Um, and it turns out these exciting moments in poll, I mean, in uh, these exciting moments in the ratings are not equaling exciting moments in polling. No. And we talked about this a little bit last week and we've talked about his bad polling as sort of like how there hasn't been sort of like a rally around the flag thing. And, you know, he's lagging in swing state polling and, and all of these things. So anyway, last week after this mess of a press conference where he told everybody to, you know, disinfect themselves, um, he huddled with his advisors and looked at polling and newsflash, it was really bad. <laughs> It's grim. It's grim. Uh, bad enough that this meeting that he had was has been reported as like being completely like off the rails, cuckoo crazy town. Like yeah. it, with him screaming, yelling, profanities. Which of course there's profanity. Like I, I'm just, <laughs> he's not having a conversation without profanities. Yeah. Um, uh, but he also <laughs> he also apparently brad parscale his um campaign manager was on the phone because he's working from his home in florida and apparently trump was berating him for the bad like spate of polling numbers and he threatened to sue him <laughs> old habits die hard uh, amazing Just amazing donald trump is if nothing else a man who loves to sue <laughs> that's true he does what what is your yeah. final play when you're really mad at someone right you sue them obviously that's it yeah that's it um <clears throat> trump also told reuters in an interview on wednesday that he doesn't believe the polls so he's mm, no. some mixed messages coming out of his camp right well the um, poll, right so he didn't believe those polls and they also apparently part of what he was so mad about was internal polling that showed that um like from from both his campaign and from the rnc that showed that those um daily briefings were not helping him yeah and that is and that is what he really wanted to disbelieve because in his brain he was doing such a great job and they were getting such well, great ratings, getting ratings, and, ratings. right yeah. exactly but just because people are watching doesn't mean that they're enjoying that's right i was watching or daily well, I, I always had cnn during on those or doing those press conferences and they were always entertaining to me because that is the type of like political theater that is enjoyable to me in ways <laughs> that i know that it well, sometimes his press conferences are. I was going to say you. the Trump stakes press um, conference is, I think, a great example of right. television that does my not make favorite, you want to vote for a candidate, but does make you want to keep watching. Right. My favorite is the the Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts. Press speech, sure, that was another good one. Speech. Yeah. Um, you know, so like these are things that are entertaining. So I yeah. get why it is that he is probably confused. <laughs> well, in his world, ratings are polling. Like in television, right. that's what ratings are: is your polling. Right. So he does not have the ability to distinguish between the two because he comes from an environment where they are the same thing. Yeah. And supposedly that he, the word from both Trump and Parscale is that they have patched things up, but it was apparently bad enough that Parscale went up to Washington this week because he had been working from home. He'd been working from like, it's not, from Florida. So not, it's um, not good. Not, he also, not good he also apparently screamed on the call, I'm not losing to Joe Biden. Um, and I can understand why can that's understand. a concern for him because what could possibly be more embarrassing? <laughs> <laughs> that is the height of disappointing. <laughs> Ooh, yikes. Uh, meanwhile, states are starting to reopen. We're seeing a few states tiptoe in. We saw a few states tiptoe into it last week. Now that yeah. a lot of state home orders are expiring, we're going to see a few more. Um, and there's no real guidelines for what they should be doing. No one has any plans. They, we don't have the kind of testing that we should have in order to make sure that everyone's safe, nor do we have any contract tracing, uh, contact tracing networks in place. So we've basically just decided to restart the pandemic. That's exactly what we're doing. We're, we just we've stayed just, home for nothing. Yeah, we're deciding that, like, you know, people were talking about whether some people were going to have to die in the face of capitalism. And we have officially decided that, yes, in fact, they are. Yeah, some, that, the answer is just yes. The answer is yes. To save capitalism, we should just let people in Colorado die, apparently. Yeah. That's, that was our answer. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and why are they doing that also? Like, what are I, they up to? I, that is drive That whole like they're the, situation. They're the only state with, like, a Democratic governor. And, like, I just don't understand, like, what it is because they don't meet. First off, as you said, there's no actual guidelines. But the closest thing to a guideline is is that they was said that White that House had, guideline was that White House guideline where they said that you had to be posted or uh, you had to be testing 
2.6% of your population within the months of May and June. Now, nobody knows where they came up with 2.6%. It was never sort of like really actually answered, but only 40% of states are actually meeting even a 2% testing threshold. A lot of them are like miles away from 2%. Like, and also yeah. like that doesn't make any sense because like you're telling people to test that many, that much percentage of your population, but also most states have like only up until this point been testing population who are showing any sort of symptoms like that up until very recently right. has been the case even yeah. here in Los Angeles, which now has extended, expanded testing um, by quite a bit. And also you can get... Um, antibodies testing in Los Angeles. So like, but um, most of these states like aren't even anywhere near this, but have just decided that it's fine. A lot of them are also still on the upward swing of cases. Yeah. Um, well, that's was, the other thing. It was is the, the country's one... deadliest week or a deadliest day yesterday. Granted, death the is one... like a lagging indicator, but still, I mean. The one thing I remember about that White House guideline, fake guidelines, I mean, they weren't binding, so they weren't real guidelines, was that you had to be showing that you're, um, your new cases rate was decreasing for two weeks straight. Right, for two weeks. None of these states meet that criteria. Right, but also like that even still is like a confusing guideline because like, let's take here in Los Angeles, for instance, ours has been going way up in terms right, of actual numbers, people. but we're testing people more. So you really actually have to be looking at sort of like, I think percentages of positive tests and like yeah. for, o over the span of like how many actual percentage, like you, like they initially, their guideline said 2.6%. Like you have to, there has to be, first off, there has to be better guidelines. <laughs> but even well, within, but even within the guidelines that they did put out, they're just, there's not enough there for anybody to know. So, and now I'm not saying that like a place like Georgia, who was like way off, should, like they should obviously know better. Like, uh, but to a degree, this is also the fault of the federal government. For Yeah, well, for I mean, this, also there should be potentially binding guidelines. If we had a federal government that was interested in actually stopping this, we would have, we would be seeing some guidance that was more binding than what we've seen and also totally. more coordinated than what we've seen. I mean, part of the issue here is yeah. that states have just been left to their own devices to figure out what to do. And the thing is, that's all well and good if you're a country who can control their borders. But I mean, any idiot from Arizona can just drive here and give us coronavirus anytime. Totally. So it sort of matters what Arizona is up to. P.S. What they're up to is opening up their state. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's not great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, this is going to be a mess. And it's going to be yeah. like what happened in Wisconsin, where they're going to see a spike in cases two weeks from now. And that's annoying because two weeks from now is when we theoretically should have gotten to loosen up some of our guidelines. Right. And instead, we're going to be stuck in our homes for the rest of our lives because idiots in fucking Georgia needed to get haircuts so badly that they couldn't wait until they, it was safe to do it. Yep. That's what's going to happen. Yikes. Guys. Listen, guys there's only so much better. sourdough bread you can bake. <laughs> I know, right? At some point, we need I'm to I'm almost at the end of my 90-day fiancé rope yeah. here, you guys. No. I'm running it's, out of seasons. <laughs> it's, it's, and like the amount of time I've had to watch television has led me to a point where now I like, everything that I haven't yet watched is something that I'm putting off because I don't actually want to watch it. I was just saying I wanted to watch it. To keep up <laughs> and now I'm like to the point where I'm like, am I going to have to fucking watch some of this stuff? <laughs> like I, you know, I, I feel like there's, it's, it's like, when you're somebody who's never seen Game of Thrones because it's too violent for you and you're not going to yeah. enjoy Game of Thrones and I'm not going to enjoy Game of Thrones, so I haven't seen it. Like, am I going to have to start watching Game of Thrones because I've literally run out of every other television show on the <laughs> Right, you might. I mean, I might. That's the world that we're living in now. So yeah. that's, I want to get out of here before that comes to me. Yeah. Before things take that turn. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Meanwhile, in, in response to not being able to do his own press briefings, we're back to having a press secretary. You guys, like, this was exciting. This, again, also I watched. Of course. Of course. <laughs> you know, I'm working from home and I'm like actually working. So like, this, uh, and I've had to shut it off a few times because like sometimes it gets dark, like when you're watching the news, like it's easy to sort of like, you know, hear facts about coronavirus, which I'm like yeah. here for because then I feel like I'm informed. But then they immediately go to like, oh, this pregnant woman died and then her baby died and then her husband died and then like their right. entire family yeah, died. You're not trying and, to like, hear about like, everyone died. You know? Yeah. So like I'm not, I have to sort of like be judicious about my CNN watching, but um, I do enjoy the press 
three things. I sure. generally watch the Andrew Cuomo one because that's what's on when I come out and have a cup of coffee in the morning. And then I will just sort of like leave it on and I will pay attention as needed. I will mute it as needed. But like, I definitely watched it's the first one that we've had in over a year. It's been like 400 days. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we're entering a whole new era where apparently Donald Trump cannot uh, be trusted to give us information directly. And they had to finally go back to the old system where someone else lies for him. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, she she's promised, not going to lie. She promised you, which is an example of her first lie, which means she's already <laughs> violated her own. <laughs> right. So um, there's But listen, no trust you guys, there. Kaylee McEnany is the new press secretary. And she... They finally found the right press secretary. Yeah. Um, you know, they had Sean Spicer, who wasn't camera ready, who had to be, had to have terrible makeup and fake tan put on him in yeah. a way that was really Silly. unfortunate Silliness. for him. He almost looked sillier doing that than he did being the White House Easter Bunny. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was unfortunate. Sarah Sanders went through her own sort of like physical makeover while she was the press secretary right. and then stopped doing the she was the press secretary at the time. They just like stopped doing this. They've had a, another press secretary in between Sarah Sanders and Kaylee McEnany. No one heard from them. But you don't know her because she didn't do a, she never did a, um, a press briefing. So right. we finally have Kaylee McEnany and she is very pretty. Sure. She is blonde. She is skinny. She does, she does not need any of the hand holding at least visually in the way that any of the previous press secretaries did of course so she's already starting off much better in terms of like the only audience that is important which is the trump audience so she's got that down she also seemed like she was okay she's definitely <laughs> going to lie yeah, so well, like we can we know that i mean sarah sanders sent, spent the entire time lying in a way that like I can't believe didn't affect her in some way <laughs> like it was so you know I think like, it did there was start so, to there was so her. much lying I think it did actually yes um Kayla McEnany looks to be the type of person that the lying every day <laughs> will not bother probably <laughs> <laughs> and I don't really know what that means but it just yeah, strikes me do. as true I, we all know we all know <laughs> right yeah you get it um anyway so she it was like mostly fine it got contentious a little bit at one point when she brought up something that was like not even a question that was asked of her. Um, oh, right. Because, she brought up Michael Flynn. She no brought reason. up Michael Flynn. Don't bring yeah. up Michael Flynn. Everyone's doing that now. Donald Trump's doing it. Just stop doing it. Yeah, apparently uh, this was something that I had to like look for because it was not something that I ultimately cared about even remotely. But apparently what happened this week with Michael Flynn was that there were some documents released, specifically a handwritten note from the FBI that's... Um, said, quote, we need to get Flynn to lie and get him fired. And so the entire Trump world now thinks that that is the smoking gun that means Michael Flynn should be exonerated and is such a great guy, like they always thought he was in the first place. Um, but that statement sort of forgets the fact that he pleaded guilty and both he and Mike Pence acknowledged that it was... Michael Flynn lying to him that got him on the wrong side of the president. And ultimately what he is charged with is lying to federal investigators. So like we know whether the FBI was attempting to get him to lie or not, that he in fact did. <laughs> right. He, it's, the, the whole point of an investigation is to either get you to tell the truth or lie. It's to get you to say something. Right. So that's, well, if, if well, you don't that's want the, to be accused of lying to federal investigators, the thing that you should avoid doing is well, lying to them. Well, right. And that's what the whole, if you read through all of the documents that were released, that whole handwritten, like converse, th th all of those notes, that conversation was more a debate about how forthcoming the FBI should be with him and others at the White House about the nature of their investigation. So it was more about like, are we going to lie to like get him to say what we want him to say? Or are we going to be sort of like truthful with him to like try and get the truth out of them? Yeah. That's more of what that conversation was than actually sort of like, we're going to like, we're going to get him. But also, as you said, the point of any investigation is to get someone. That's, right. <laughs> right? That's what you're doing. That, that was their plan. If that, that was their plan. whether or not that note said that. that yeah. But there was a cool. bit of a like sort of contentious back and forth between um, McEnany and journalists who were prodding her on that because she brought yeah. it up. So they were like, but wait, that's not 
actually what happens. Yeah, well, um, she's, she's, not, she's not afraid to lie to them about a thing that she didn't need to bring up in the first place that <laughs> no, has to not. do with lying on the heels of saying that she won't lie to them. <laughs> so she won't lie. This whole thing yeah, exactly. just tracks perfectly. Yeah. Um, in any case, there was some big drama in the electoral world uh, this week because Justin Amash decided to form an exploratory committee and is probably most definitely running for president looking for the libertarian nomination. Yeah. And also Jesse Ventura is now toying with the idea that maybe he wants to run as a green, which is random. That's um, confusing. And the entire democratic establishment got into like a crazy tizzy about it. But here's what I have to say about it. Yes. Because everyone's instinct I think was wrong. Just as uh, I had I said so earlier um, that we are still early in the process and maybe this, we probably should have reported this story when I was saying that, because I think it's a point that is incredibly valuable here. If you really care about getting rid of Donald Trump, which I think we can all agree we do, even if we don't agree about how. And one thing that, you know, the middle likes to launch accusations at the left that we don't care enough to go along with their cockamamie plan. But I think the one thing we all have in common is that we all absolutely care about defeating Donald Trump. Of course. Then we should be willing to try anything right now. It's so early. It's not yet convention time. We haven't settled on who's going to be in the race. Polling doesn't know what a third party candidate will do to this race. Justin Amash is like, I know that because, because he's a never Trumper and because he took this hard stand in Congress, it seems like he's a principled person and he is principled, but like so many people, he's principled with the wrong principles. Right. And he's, those principles are not principles He's one of the shared. founding members of the Freedom Caucus. Exactly. I mean, These are not he's not principles. someone that the, the left is going to toy with voting for. No, and also that are not really shared by the middle either. He wants to get rid of Social Security. Right. You know, he's pro-life. So if you are thinking that the kind of voters that would vote for Justin Amash are voters you think Joe Biden is going to rely on to not win his election, real. then you have just explained to yourself why the left and is not going to vote for Joe Biden and then also why you're going to lose the election. Right. Because those are voters that the, the right is even more entrenched than we are. Right. Those voters are not going to move to Joe. You cannot assume that every voter that doesn't want to vote for Donald Trump is going to move to Joe Biden. You just can't uh, make that assumption. No, what you, you can do is try to peel off support from the right. And we would be, I would be remiss. We would all be remiss, I think, if we didn't at least test the waters with that. You know why we had a President Clinton? It was because a billionaire named Ross Perot peeled voters off the right. It was not yeah. because Bill Clinton was winning a majority of voters. He wasn't. So right. If well, and we that's the thing. Are like, really honest about this, then it's worth a try. It's worth seeing what happens. Right. And the thing that I think is so that annoys me about all of this discussion is because, you know, we uh, Biden supporters are in a wild panic about this, and I yeah. get in and even about Justin Abosh. Like, yeah. not even just Jesse Ventura running for the Green candidate, to which yeah. I respond to everyone, like, there will be a Green Party nominee for president. Right. whoever like, it is. Right. Th th it'll be a person. And, like, right. sure, maybe Jesse Ventura gets, like, a few more votes than, like, Howie Hawkins does, but, like, who knows, you know? I mean... Right. Somebody um, is going to run for voting. the Green Party. Right. I'm not voting for Jesse Ventura, no. by the way. Like, you no. know, he ran as... He was the Reform Party governor of exactly. Minnesota of the, you know, like, of the terrible Reform Party. Um, yeah. So like, no, he's like a libertarian. Uh, like the, 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 he's like a libertarian, like the Pat Robertson Reform Party, and I know that he sort of like has denounced that like part of the Reform, reform Party. But like, no, but he's a terrible person. Like nobody's voting for uh, nobody on the far, far, far left is voting for Jesse Ventura. Yeah. I mean, maybe some like weird goons just to make a point. But like, he's not really a threat. Anyway, I don't think anyway. Yeah. I mean, maybe sure. other than name recognition, which I get is like a big thing. But right. like the thing that like so the reason that they're mad, and I get the math. Like um, the math is, is that Donald Trump is not a majority candidate. Like he's never going to win a majority of votes. Like he, right. he can't, like he's just like not the type of candidate that can. So the more votes that like peel off from one of the two major candidates, like just sort of like lowers the plurality that he has to get. Like I, I can understand right. that. Like I'm a, a person who can like acknowledge math. Right. But like you also have to acknowledge sort of like voter emotion. <laughs> too. Yeah. And like, I just don't think that that leads people to either of these candidates in a way that becomes meaningful. And beyond that, I would say both Justin Amash and Jesse Ventura are looking at the people who are at the top of the ticket from the party that they belong to. Although Jesse Ventura, I don't think probably belongs to the Democratic well, no. Party. But like, let's just presume that he sort of is like, that's where he's peeling. He's votes of like, us, let's just like David. throw him into there just for, you know, yeah. an experiment here. Like, 
neither of them are people who are getting into this race if they see that the person who is at the top of the ticket with the party that they might like recognize as being a strong candidate. Yeah. And that I think sort of like goes back to my point of like, we don't have to be stuck with Biden. You know, I mean, Jill Stein, as we have pointed out a million different times, ran for the Green Party. She was the Green Party nominee in 2012. Right. Never heard a uh, word about her. Nobody gave one single damn about her because A, she didn't <clears throat> affect the outcome. But even going into the election, I never heard of Jill Stein. Yeah. And that was because I was a person who was like ready to vote for Barack Obama because he wasn't a giant fuck up. Right. <laughs> No, you know, I also, like, I think I, 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 we, like, we share one goal with Justin Amash, which is that he is also a never Trumper. So right. his goal here as a third party candidate who does not probably think he can win is to I make sure that we so. don't have a President Trump. Right. I think it's foolish. I mean, it's, this is just what the Democrats did with Biden, though, where they kind of like rushed into a losing strategy and then they backed themselves into a corner. I, it is still early enough that we should welcome any buddy who is seeking to change at least that. So Justin Amash maybe will do internal polling and find that he is not helping defeat Trump. And if that's the case, I would assume he's going to get out of the race. I think so too. Because he's not going to win. And his whole reason to run is to make sure Donald Trump doesn't win. And yeah. I don't think it's a bad idea for somebody to try to actually hit Donald Trump where it hurts with the Republican base. These totally. are voters that are not gonna vote for Joe Biden. They don't actually share even vague values with Joe Biden. And there are not, I think in, in the Beltway, everyone is so like familiar with the sort of Steve Schmidt genre of Republican, these sort right. of like never Trump Republicans who are kind of like vaguely flirting with a that Biden. That is not the Justin uh, Amash That's crowd. not the Justin Amash crowd. And that's also not what, where most Republicans are. Most Republicans are not vaguely flirting with a Joe Biden-esque person. If you identify right now in this climate as a Republican, or even if you identify right now in this climate as an independent, then yeah. you are likely not somebody, you are likely someone who's already made an active choice not to vote for a Democratic candidate. So uh, we're yeah. giving those voters somewhere to go is not a bad idea. And maybe the polling will show that it is a bad idea. And if that's the case, he should get out. But the idea that we would criticize anyone for trying something crazy when we should be trying everything. Like yeah. Donald Trump is terrible. We should try anything to get rid of yeah. him. And sometimes that means finding a Ross Perot to split the, the conservative vote. Yep. And if that's, what it, if that's what it's gonna take, then that's fine. That, but, but we all share the goal of getting rid of Donald Trump. We can't pretend like our strategy, which is proving to be the dumbest strategy on earth, is the only strategy, and if anyone else tries any other strategy, that they're electing Donald Trump. That's yeah, crazy talk. I agree. But that's, it, it goes further, I think, it goes back to this sort of democratic sense that they like are owed these votes from people. Yep. Because that's, the friends that I was talking to about this with were kind of like, but they're gonna, he's gonna take votes from Biden. And I was like, Biden doesn't have these votes. Biden has to earn these votes. Yep. He can't take votes from Biden that Biden has earned for himself. This is, it is not crazy <laughs> to suggest that a candidate should view voting and should view their outreach as an attempt to earn votes from people. Yeah. So why can't your supporters talk like you get that? Yep. And why is this so threatening? It's not threatening <laughs> to you. Justin Amash has nothing in common with anything having to do with the Democrats. <laughs> I know. He's a lunatic. Yeah, like, I, job. So in any case, I think that was an overblown thing. One thing that was not overblown enough was the reappearance of Kim Jong-un. <laughs> who is theoretically alive based on photographs, but not video that they showed from a ribbon cutting ceremony from it. And then also uh, the press release says the crowd, quote, broke into thunderous cheers of hurrah. But I watched the, I, I mean, didn't watch the video. I saw the clip and you can't see anything anywhere. It feels like there was not a crowd. There's no indication that there's a crowd in the photo. But my point is, I'm incredibly disappointed because whether or not this is fake, and I honestly don't care what, one way or the other. Yeah. If you are going to fake your own death in order to <laughs> return in a glorious, right. you know, ribbon cutting pretend moment. Like you, pretend like you were dead. You have some theatrical <laughs> instincts and fucking rise from the dead like a right. fucking dictator. Like, I, don't, <laughs> right. don't tell me that you couldn't think of a better reappearance than this dumb ribbon cutting ceremony. <laughs> I right. hold, this is a man whose grandfather decided he was a deity. Yeah. I hold this family up to a very high standard when it comes to crazy theater. <laughs> this is the most abject. Well, because they, 
they've failure. Come, they've come through on that crazy theater many yes. times. They are usually so good at this. They get this it. This is the biggest failure of potential. As my mom said, she thought that he was doing it so he could rise from For the dead. Easter. Like, yes. And you know what? Right. That's what I was hoping would happen if he right. was alive. Right. Maybe if even if he was dead. I mean, I don't know. I was just hoping that this moment would would be used properly by a repressive regime famous for their crazy theatrics and asking people to believe insane things about what they're up to. Yeah. And that they would rise to the moment. And instead we get this bullshit picture of him cutting a ribbon. I don't- Yeah, missed opportunity. Care about that. <laughs> in any case, so I may be mad about Joe Biden, but I am really mad about the missed opportunity in North <laughs> Korea here. And let that be yeah. what you take away from this podcast. <laughs> in any case. Uh. Um, we went on a long time and we get that. <laughs> right. But we'll be back next week with more because that's us. Yeah. You know? you know what? Here's the thing. Sometimes when the stories that are going on right now, also, well, here's another thing. We've been left. Sorry. <laughs> We've been, I know, a, as we <laughs> talked about going on for too long, you know, we're sitting in our own homes and we've been left to our own thoughts. That's right. We have a lot of thinking that we're getting through here. <laughs> and this is a place to put all of those thoughts. That's, Brent and I keep trying to watch Married at First Sight on Zoom, and every time we do it, we spend an hour complaining about politics before we even get to turn on Married at I First Sight. I know. I think it was like Tuesday or Wednesday of this week where we like watched one of them, what? and like we got on, and like it was like a full hour, and then we were both like, oh shit, are we going to watch this? Because like we have to go to bed. Right. <laughs> Sometimes you've been Ugh. sitting at home all day ranting, and you need someone to share that with. Right. And... Uh, and you are that person. That's right. <laughs> so, you, I'm talking about podcast. The, the audience, right. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.